Thank you so much, David. And a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us. I can't think of a more profitable way we could be spending these few minutes than together considering truths about the Lord Jesus. I'd like to read with you two very familiar passages, Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now it will be very quickly evident that rather than the snake speaking, the serpent speaking, that the devil was embodying this serpent and was attracting Adam and Eve, or at least at this case, Eve. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And of course, we all know the dread results as Adam and Eve partook of that tree in disobedience to God. Down the chapter, it says that Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. And then chapter four of this same book, Cain, you'll remember that he is the first person born into the world, the eldest son of Adam and Eve. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. He killed him. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? I have read to you the first questions ever asked, not only in the Bible, but ever asked in this world. These three passages show us, first of all, the first question of Satan to us, the first question of a human to God, and the first question of God to mankind. Now, questions are a thought-provoking method of communication. They compel us to think, to, to ponder, and they are constantly used in our everyday speech patterns. Questions can also be used for other purposes, as we have seen in this evening's readings. They were used to deceive, to deflect, and to demonstrate or display something. The devil used a question to mislead and deceive in the Garden of Eden. Cain used the question in a vain attempt to deflect blame away from himself. And God used the question to display his unchanging concern for his creatures. To me, there is something portentous and significant about these questions because what they reveal are characteristics that have continued to this day. The devil is still trying to deceive us. We are still trying to evade guilt and blame. Thank God, God is still seeking to reconcile fearful, fallen sinners to himself. So these are not simply questions from the dim, distant past, but are questions that relate to us in a very real way today. So notice, please, the first question of the devil to us. The question was calculated to make Eve, and in this case, Adam as well, doubt the veracity of God's word. The devil said, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, it was a purposeful misquoting of what God said, and the devil is excellent at misquoting God's word to people. The question actually meant, did God really tell you that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Now, it engaged Eve in a conversation she should never have had, and that initial question laid the groundwork for the awful lies that ensued. It was followed by a blatant denial, blatant denial of what God said. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Now, despite the Bible's flawless track record of perfection and veracity, corroborated by centuries of scientific discovery and archaeological findings, there are still people today who insist that the Bible is merely a book like any other and is not to be thought of as inspired and perfect. In other words, questioning God's word. People who do this do this in the face of centuries of evidence 
to the fact that they are wrong and the Bible has always been proved right. You'll notice that this opened the way to make them and many people since doubt the sincerity of God's interest and love. Satan said in verse five of Genesis chapter three, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like him. You'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. By making them question God's word to them, the devil made them question God's will for them. Of course, the implication was that God was unkind, that he was withholding something good from them, that he did not want what was best for them. Still today, when troubles or sorrows come into our life, there is a voice ready to whisper in our ear that God is to blame. And why has he done this to us? It is really sin that has caused our misery. It is really the devil that has led us into such chaos. And yet it is God who is blamed as the devil whispers that insinuation in the ears of so many. The added implication was that God was petty, petulant, and selfish, that he did not want them to challenge his supremacy and share any of his power. And still today, many think of God as a demanding autocrat who only does what is best for him rather than us. Finally, the implied thought was that their real happiness lay in ignoring God and his word and doing what they wanted. Since this is practically one definition of sin, it is a reminder that rebelling against God leads us down a path of self-destruction. The devil's deception is still powerfully at work in our world. Through the centuries, tourists have visited the famous Acropolis, the ancient hilltop religious citadel in Athens. Thousands of sightseers from all over the world, despite the signs that are posted, have surreptitiously picked up marvel chunks from the ground as souvenirs to bring home and say that this was a, 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 an actual souvenir from the Acropolis. Strangely enough, the supply of pieces, marble pieces, has not been exhausted. Despite the thousands of people who have visited, there's always marble fragments lying around. This is because every few months, a truckload of marble fragments from a quarry just miles away comes in and the load is scattered around the whole Acropolis area. Tourists go home thinking that they have an authentic piece of history when they are actually carrying home a worthless fragment. Sadly, throughout the history of mankind, the devil has deceived millions as to where true life true peace, true joy, true hope are to be found. If you have been so deceived, please understand that the God from whom you have been running all your life is searching for you, to rescue you, to deliver you from your sins and from the hopelessness that those sins create in our hearts. You will see that in the first question of man to God. First of all, notice that this question indicates how progressive sin is, like a terminal illness. The first man who was created, Adam, tried to hide from God. The first man who was born, Cain, lied to God. Adam and Eve tried to escape the guilt of their sin by shifting the blame onto others. Apparently, they never dreamed of telling God that they had not sinned. But Cain, almost as though he imagined that God did not know what he had done, Cain implied that Abel must be elsewhere. And how was he, Cain, to know where Abel was? He wasn't his brother's keeper. You see, sin had dramatically worsened in just one generation. And the question that Cain asked, am I my brother's keeper? It also indicates how powerful sin is. Sin is fast acting and formidable in its horrible effects. At work in the human heart since the middle of Genesis chapter three, sin only took one Bible page, turned the page to chapter four. And as I mentioned, one generation to move from the disobedience committed by Adam to the murder committed by Adam's son. It indicates how pervasive sin is. Adam and Eve did not have to teach Cain to be deceitful, to be angry, to be murderous. All that came out of Cain's own heart, a heart of sin. While the Bible reminds us that salvation is not hereditary, sin is. It is passed on from generation to generation, from parents to children. It has filled the earth and it has flooded the heart of every child of Adam's race. One Democratic politician from Hawaii has for a long time fought for stricter punishments against drunken drivers. 
Apparently, this was because she was hit. Her car was hit by a driver who was driving under the influence. She even bragged on her website that one of her, quote, greatest accomplishments was getting a new DUI law passed. But it seems like she thought that law didn't apply to her. Because on March the 5th, this month, this year, she was arrested driving under the influence and driving the wrong way down a one way street. She may have been angry at others disobeying the laws, but she was just as guilty. The fact remains that while we do not all sin the same way, we all sin. All have sinned. All come short of the glory of God. Finally, notice the first question of God to us. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where are you? Where art thou? This question presents us with the immediate and ongoing effects of sin. Sin caused darkness, a mental and spiritual darkness in their minds and hearts. They already began to have clouded and twisted thoughts about God. Adam would express that by not only blaming Eve, but saying that God as well was to be blamed since he had given him Eve to be his wife. It created a distance, a moral and spiritual distance between God and mankind. Part of Adam and Eve's already warped thoughts about God was that they could not expect any mercy or grace from him. When they heard God's approach, they fled in terror and cowered behind the trees. Adam would have to admit, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. He had never been afraid of God and never been afraid to meet God before. But sin had created this awful difference, this terrible distance, this chasm, this canyon between God, the creator, and man, his creature. And it resulted in death. Sin brought spiritual death into their souls. And soon before their very eyes, they saw its effects in the death of a substitute. To our first parents who had never seen anything die in their world, it must have been a stunning sight to watch a living being lying, lifeless at their feet, a living being dying in their place. Now, as we saw in Cain and realize in our own hearts, this did not end at the close of Genesis chapter three or Genesis chapter four. Sin still darkens the human mind about everything related to God. The Bible makes that so clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, telling us that the devil, the God of this age, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should not shine unto them. Romans chapter 1 speaks of nations, and this to me as an American is a very fearful thought. Romans chapter one speaks about nations that turn away from God and from the light of God's truth. And it says that because that when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. In other words, nations that turn from God are embraced by further and deeper darkness. And in Ephesians chapter four, the apostle Paul writes about those and he is describing us human beings who have our understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in us because of the blindness of our heart. Those are solemn, sweeping words in their application. Our distance from God and our spiritual deadness are facts that can not only be read in the Bible and seen in history, but seen in our own life as well. So please notice that the question presents us with the gracious and perpetual efforts of God. God did not leave our first parents in their horrible, sinful state. His question, where are you? Was not because he did not know where they were, but it was because they did not know or fully realize where they were and what sin had done to them. So the question introduces us to this marvelous fact. The God who has full authority to judge us and every right to punish us is instead mercifully and graciously seeking to save us. Look at the provision that he has made through the person and work of his beloved son. And I will just limit myself to the things that I mentioned, the effects of sin were, and I wanna show you God's marvelous salvation in that context. Although sin has darkened our minds, the Lord Jesus came as the light of the world. He states that a person who follows him shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That is the light in which life was intended to be lived. In the context of the healing of a blind man, John chapter nine, 
The Lord Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The Lord Jesus is the light. He is the truth. He speaks truth. He communicates truth. He is the one who brings light to the darkened minds of sinners. He is the light for the world. And although sin has distanced us and alienated us from God, the Lord Jesus came to bring us to God, not only to bring us to heaven when life is done, but to bring us to God now to reconcile us as the shepherd. He sought to rescue us from our distant, perishing condition. The parable he told in Luke 15 about the shepherds finding the one lost sheep describes the shepherd's care and competence as he finds the sheep and brings it safely home. The reality is that in order to do that, he would have to give his life. Not long before he went to Calvary, he said that he, the good shepherd, would give his life. That sacrifice his life. He would give his life for the sheep. He would do that by dying on the cross. As the Savior, he suffered, enduring the penalty that our sins deserved. The Apostle Paul wrote, Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. As I have said, the Bible's word for this is reconciliation. Christ died to bring us back to God, to reconcile us to God. All the blame, all the wrongdoing is on our part. It's not about meeting God part way or halfway. It is not about God making concessions and then we match that. It is that we are guilty sinners, completely in the wrong. And the Lord Jesus can and wants to bring us to God, to reconcile us to God. And although sin had robbed us of spiritual life, the Lord Jesus came to provide eternal life for us. Again and again, we read of this marvelous provision on our behalf. In the Bible's best known verse, John chapter 3 and verse 16, the Savior said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The third chapter of that gospel chapter, the third chapter ends with these words. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord Jesus laid down his life in willing sacrifice so you could have eternal life. Someone has pointed out that God created our bodies to need food, air, water. When those things are removed, we die. He created our spirits, the real us, to be joined to him, cut off from him, cut off from God, alienated from God. We lack life. To have Christ is to have eternal life, spiritual life. Christ offers us that. He offers us himself, which is why the Bible says the person who has the son has this life. When we have Christ, we have life with a capital L eternal life. Now, the three questions that we've considered tonight confront my audience with one huge, perhaps as of yet unanswered question. It is this, what will you do with God's offer of salvation through his beloved son? The way one man, Pontius Pilate, the governor, expressed it, makes it a very personal question for us all. And I will ask it in his words. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? What will you do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? The Christians who are sponsoring this meeting, and I can join them, we hope you will answer that wisely tonight by receiving Christ and by trusting him as your Savior.